Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Judd Lamb. I'm the Executive Manager of Policy Development and Research at Carers New South Wales and a proud part of the Care Knowledge Exchange team, which is a partnership project between Carers New South Wales and the Institute for Public Policy and Governance at the University of Technology, Sydney. Very happy to welcome you to the second of three uh, webinars this week in recognition of National Carers Week um, that have a policy and research focus. Um, and our topic today is how and why to participate in research for family and friend carers. Uh, importantly, um, if we can move to the next slide, please, Giselle. I wanted to start uh, today's event by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that our speakers are speaking on today, um, and also that our attendees are joining from today. Um, I'm presenting from Gorgal land in North Sydney, and I want to extend my respects to elders past and present in all the lands that are represented today, um, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander carers that are joining us today as well, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We can move to the next slide, please. Um, some of you may already be connected with the Care Knowledge Exchange. Um, this is a little overview if you're not, um, but this Care Knowledge Exchange is delivering today's National Carers Week event. Um, and we'll provide some links and opportunities to connect in with the project a bit later in today's webinar. Um, National Carers Week, uh, thanks Tian, I'm um, putting the, the link to the website in the chat. National Carers Week um, is a time every year that um, those of us that are carers or work with carers set aside to celebrate and recognise the important contributions that carers make in our communities. Um, and this webinar, along with some others that Carers New South Wales has been delivering this week, um, is looking at particularly uh, policy making and uh, the evidence base. Um, and this, today's webinar is really focused on carers uh, as our audience. Um, and we want to talk about recognizing carers through shared voices of lived experience in research. Um, so we're pleased to have some guest speakers today uh, sharing that with you. Um, and really, our aim with today's webinar is to give you some more information as carers about uh, what is involved with participating in research. Um, and why carers' involvement in research is important. And so we'll be hearing from um, a researcher's perspective, uh, we'll be hearing from a carer's perspective, and we'll be hearing about some specific opportunities um, through Carers New South Wales to get involved in research. So um, we will also, uh, as well as the chat and the Q&A function, um, we will we'll launch a couple of polls um, in a minute, uh, which I think Lucy's gonna do for us, um, just to capture um, those present today, uh, where you're coming from in terms of experience with research. Um, so if you could just have a look at those questions on your screen, um, let us know uh, whether you're um, a carer and or have other roles that you're joining with today's webinar, um, whether you've participated in research before um, and whether you had any kind of particular questions in mind as you join today's event. So um, just have a look at those questions. Let us know um, your thoughts if you feel comfortable um, and then we'll have a, a good idea of um, who we've got in our audience today. So um, thank you very much for doing that. Um, now, as uh, those poll responses are coming in, um, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker today, who's also uh, running our slides for the moment. Um, and that is Dr. Giselle Diego, um, who is uh, working at the University of Notre Dame, Australia and the Center for Disability Studies. And Giselle is a clinical and health services researcher with skills and experience in knowledge translation and the use of mixed methods in research. And Giselle's research and teaching focus uh, on the experiences of culturally and linguistically diverse people and those living with a disability um, and how those interact. And she's a disability advocate and an inclusive researcher. And um, most importantly to this project, um, Giselle is part of the Care and Knowledge Exchange Research Advisory Group, um, a group of uh, 12 researchers who work with the Care Knowledge Exchange, Exchange team uh, around developing the project. So um, we're pleased to start with Giselle today, who will be speaking to us about why researchers value carer input. So over to you, Giselle. Thank you very much, Sarah. So I'll go straight into it. Well, first of all, I am in Gadigal land from the Aura Nation, and I am um, I can be she, her, I've got long hair, uh, dark skin, 
for those who may have a bit of visual impairment. And why we value care as input? Well, I think for me, obviously, it's a no brainer because I think we need to value the lived experience. So, for example, me as a woman of color from a culturally linguistic diverse background cannot represent all experiences of cow people. So, I think it's really important to have that effort that input. It's also very important that research is relevant and useful. So those people who are impacted by research have a say on what's important on what matters. And ultimately, the goal is to lead to better services, treatments and care, but care for the person and care for the carer. So it's kind of a, a, a double edge, uh, not a double edge, but it's a two, two prone system where everyone benefits from it. We benefit carers benefit, the person they care for, everyone benefits. And that leads to that benefits to everyone, including us. So why join a research project? Well, it's a hard, you know, you you have a limited time in your day, you're caring after someone, um, there's just so much you can do. But I do think that there is a sense of, it gives you agency and control. You can build and trust connections with researchers. I hope that in that process, you also feel empowered and ultimately because you're improving both your outcomes and potentially the outcomes of the person you care for, I think it gives us a sense of control in a way in so many things that we are out of our control. But more importantly, it increases the accountability and transparency of research. So by you being engaged in research, it means that we have to be accountable and be transparent and make sure that we said what we said we're going to do. Uh, and importantly, from a research perspective, I want to build those that trust and mutual understanding. So for us to speak the same language and to understand each other. What to expect? So this is where it gets very interesting. So you could either be research on, which is what not I'm not interested in. I'm actually interested in doing research with you. So I want what this word has been coined and thrown around a lot called co-design. And basically it is that you get involved in the research from the beginning. And in, in this instance, it means that you get involved defining what the problem is. So what the research questions we should address in planning and designing what we wanna do in telling us how we should do it and what's the best way to do it. And importantly, also in interpreting what the results mean. And finally, in how we translate the knowledge that we gain from the research and communicate the fundings. That's one way, it's co-design, but not always happens. So sometimes you may be invited to participate in a survey or maybe invited to participate in an interview or in a focus group. So that's the second way to be involved. But importantly, it's we need to have governance and we need to have ethics approval. So all research and good research, and I have to really highlight that it's good research, needs to have and any research, not only good research, needs to be have ethics approval. And that ensures that we protect everyone, that we protect the rights and the welfare of participants, that we protect ourselves, that we adhere to ethical standards so that we do good research, that we kind of make sure that everyone, for example, gets um, to debrief after a conversation that it's quite um, for example, daunting, or that you get access to the research findings. That's part of a good research. And that's also um, worthwhile in providing value weights and that it awaits the risk before uh, against the harm. So, Because sometimes we think it's a great research, but it kind of has some potential risk. And is that upset by, outside by the benefits that you gain? So we always have to have the benefits should always be outweighed the risk that we put people in for any research to happen and that it is worthwhile doing so there is no point keep doing the same research over and over again when it's already been done so that's what it's important and that's what ethics provides provides that guarantee that everyone is being safeguarded and that's all i had to do and i hope you have lots of questions and comments and discussion and i think i had to hand over back to sarah Thanks so much, Giselle, um, for introducing our session today. I can see we've already had a question come through. Please feel free to add uh, comments or questions in the chat and Q&A as we go, and then we can come back to those in our discussion time later. So um, we are next going to hear from um, another valued member of the Care Knowledge Exchange team, and that is Prudence Rose Granger, who is our carer in residence. Um, and so I think I will hand over to you now, um, Prue. Oh, no, I have your bio here as well. Um, so. Uh, uh, Prudence was a carer for her father who had on, early onset Alzheimer's. During this experience, she learned firsthand the unique challenges of being a carer, which led to a passion for supporting and improving the life of carers. 
This first led to her advocacy with Dementia Australia. This advocacy encouraged her first steps into research participation. Uh, Prudence's participation in advocacy and research opened the doors for the current unique role she is in as part of the Care and Knowledge Exchange, the Care in Residence, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is an active opportunity to lead with lived experience within research and policy. Um, and Prue is privileged to speak during Carers Week uh, directly to carers, those of you here today, about research participation and its potential to create a better future for carers. Um, so over to you, Prue. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. So as Sarah said, my name is Prue and I'm the carer in residence for the Carer Knowledge Exchange. Um, being a carer is a very unique experience and a different experience for every individual, depending on who they're caring for, what their unique um, context is, and how that then affects them personally. And so with such a broad spectrum of care, uh, it's important to have each individual's input in research. Otherwise, a true reflection isn't um, gained by those researching, which in turn means uh, positive policy shifts can happen. Um, so for me personally, as Sarah mentioned, I started my journey towards where I am now by doing advocacy for Dementia Australia. And while being a part of Dementia Australia, um, I was offered different opportunities to participate in research. Some things were just really simple um, uh, surveys, other things were going in for a day and kind of speaking to my experiences and other um, situations have turned out to be more long form or co-design experiences as Giselle just mentioned. Um, each and every one of these experiences has their own benefits. Uh, and I think it's really, really important when approaching um, research to understand uh, what is important to you. So one thing that I've definitely learned is to choose topics of research that interest you. Um, so if you're participating in a research project and it's a topic that perhaps isn't something that is super relevant to your life or um, relevant to who you're caring for or your care experience, it can sometimes feel a little um, washed out. And so look into what the intention of that research is before you participate. Um, so say, for example, I had the opportunity once to participate in a research project that was concentrating on holistic approaches to care. Um, so how you can incorporate things such as mindfulness, meditation, um, and things like that in caring for people with Alzheimer's and how that can um, impact them and support them. Uh, being a yoga teacher um, and meditation teacher outside of my care and residence and caring responsibilities, that was something that really interested me and something that I valued participating in as I believed in it. Um, so that would definitely be my first uh, point of um, advice if you're thinking of getting into research or if you're unsure if research is for you, because if you do enter into something that doesn't interest you or isn't relevant to you, uh, you're more likely to taper off or not feel like you're having a value add to that experience. Um, and so from there, as I said earlier, there's those different elements. So the co-design, in my opinion, is something that um, is much more interactive and can feel much more valuable to you in your participation. You get more time um, to be involved and to see results. However, with that, it does mean it is a bigger time input from you. So it might be a bit more tricky in regards to scheduling. It might be a bit more tricky in regards to making sure that your loved one who you care for is cared for in those times. Um, but the thing is about that, generally researchers are pretty understanding. So if your life circumstances change, if you are struggling to get to the appointed time, you are able to speak directly to them and make different options to make it work for you and what it is you need. Um, and so always, always be um, open to advocating for yourself within these um, positions. I always want to encourage every carer in every walk of life to participate in research because that's how we get a broad cross section and a true reading of what carers need. Um, and I understand that sometimes we do get a bit fatigued that, you know, we're participating so much. We're not necessarily seeing the results that um, we would like, but 
without participating, nothing would ever happen. And so it is sometimes one step at a time and it can feel like two steps forward and one step back, but those two step forwards are still a step forward in um, the eventual outcome. Uh, and that leads me to what I'm doing today as the care and residence in the care and knowledge exchange. I think that is really true co-design. Um, in this role, I bring my lived experience to it every single day. Uh, I'm allowed to have more creative input. I work directly with the team. Um, I am involved in every element of the project. Um, and I do really feel like it's the gold standard of participation. And so when it comes to research, there are many different forms. There are many different ways of involvement. And this particular role has me working weekly with the team. I am employed. I'm a part of the team. Um, and I truly feel really, really valued in this role. And it has led to me creating um, lots of different um, tools and portals for carers, which has just been actually shared in the chat here, which is the Care Knowledge Exchange Carer Hub, which features um, a blog series I've been slowly writing. And then also what has just been released, um, on Tuesday is a new podcast. And this podcast is designed to be a true reflection of the care experience. Um, it is bringing in different carers from different walks of life and having really candid conversations about their experience of care from their perspective. So not so much concentrating on who you are caring for, which we can sometimes get a little bit caught up in as carers, but how that is impacting you. Um, and it's something that I am really proud to have achieved through my participation in this project and in conjunction with UTS, um, IPPG and Impact Studios, as well as Carers New South Wales. We do have a quick little trailer of the podcast, which I'd love to share with you now. Hi, I am Prudence Granger, and I was the carer for my dad who had early onset Alzheimer's. This is Care to Share. On this show, I have open and honest conversations with carers. We talk about the challenges, roadblocks, and joys of caring. I think the only reason I've been able to do so well as a carer late in life is because I was a carer when I was younger. And I think those little things that happened had primed me. A carer is someone who cares for a family member, loved one, or friend living with a disability or illness. You just do it because you want to do it. It's not a chore, is it? No, not at all. I mean, still, I'll miss being with Bev today. Carers are often hidden and misunderstood. I'm excited to share their stories with you. It just felt so natural that it didn't really feel like I was a carer. It didn't really occur to me that that was what I was doing. When am I the carer? When am I the partner? For us, that shifts the dynamic of our relationship because you're not on equal playing ground anymore. I would like to dedicate this show to my dad, Timothy Granger. He passed away during the recording of this season. Caring for him was an experience that has changed my life forever. He was my biggest champion, my best friend, and now my greatest inspiration. Caring can be a lonely experience. I'm of course grateful for the time I shared with my father as his carer. We had plenty of fun and shared a lot of love. But for me, the struggles did eventually outweigh the joy and the lack of community or support in the caring world can be very isolating. This podcast is an opportunity to break down the stigmas around care by hearing firsthand the stories of those who live this experience every day. Please listen with care. Thank you all for listening and I hope you can um, listen further to our first episode, which has now been released. Um, if you do have any specific questions for me, um, please pop them in the Q&A uh, section and we'll get to as many as we can later on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Prue. And um, it is so important to have our work in the Care and Knowledge Exchange grounded in the care experience. And that's um, as Prue mentioned, why the care and residence role is a critical part of this project. And um, while it's been great to see Prue being innovative around how carers' stories are captured and shared through the Care Knowledge Exchange digital platform and um, the new podcast as well and the blog, 
Um, and also I mentioned the research advisory group earlier, um, which is co-delivering today's um, event, but we also have a carer advisory group, uh, which actually uh, co-designed and delivered our last Care Knowledge Exchange webinar. Um, so that's another way as well, we're bringing carer voices into this project. Um, and it's just, it's so important as well to see your comments and questions coming through around the practicalities of research. And we know that it doesn't always go perfectly. And so thanks also Prue for your tips around um, how to navigate those opportunities. Um, and uh, we will be hearing next from our last presenter before we move into a discussion uh, time and we can um, answer your questions as well. Um, and we'll be hearing from Dr. Lucas Hofstader, um, who is my colleague at Carers New South Wales, the Senior Research and Development Officer. Um, and Lucas were, uh, leads the work for the National Carer Survey um, and is responsible for other Carers New South Wales research projects, collaborations and service evaluations. He holds a PhD in sociology um, from Goethe University Frankfurt and Macquarie University in Sydney. And he previously worked as a university lecturer and researcher. And so Lucas is gonna to talk to us about some specific research participation opportunities through Carers New South Wales and how you can get involved um, if you would like to do so. So Lucas, over to you. Thank you. So, hi, thanks for this introduction. My name's Lucas. Um, like Sarah said, I work for Carers New South Wales. Um, just a quick word, just in case someone missed who we are. Uh, we are the PIDNOM uh, government uh, organization uh, representing family and friend carers in New South Wales. And uh, in that function, we actively promote care recognition and inclusion through uh, systematic advocacy, service provision, and research. And I'm um, talking about the research on the next slide. Um, that's my role there. Um, so uh, it is part of our uh, funding by uh, the New South Wales government um, to be involved in research and to uh, promote, like I said, um, CARES involvement in research. Um, why do we do research? We do research to provide an evidence base on the one hand for our advocacy, for our own uh, advocacy in the policy world so that we can tell our stakeholders, um, tell government what are the issues, what can we do about it, and that we can back that up not just with um, having thought things through, but also with the voices of, of carers directly. Um, sometimes that voice is uh, translated into numbers when we um, work with survey data, but very often we um, use what carers told us very directly through consultations and qualitative data. Um, another um, role that we fulfill in the research space is that we support researchers to include carers' voice and lived experience in their projects directly. Um, we work with uh, both, on the one hand, we have independent research projects that we do ourselves, and we work collaborative with other researchers uh, across the country, basically, um, on research that is uh, inclusive of carers, that is impactful for carers and that concerns carers in uh, many different ways. Uh, we also participate in advisory groups um, to academically led research projects, uh, steering committees, uh, or sometimes we collaborate as co-investigators on bigger research grants. To start off with sort of one of our own and independent uh, research projects on the next slide, um, uh, that will be the uh, National Carers Survey, which is led by Carers New South Wales on behalf of the uh, other state and territory um, carers organizations. So for Carers New South Wales, um, Carers New South Wales since, since the beginning, uh, 40, more than 40 years ago, uh, always had sort of a research function. Carers New South Sarah always tells the story that Carers New South Wales was funded through a survey um, uh, around carers in the 1970s. And um, this tradition has been kept up. We have been conducting the uh, Carers New South Wales Carers Survey biannually, so every two years for many years now. And since 2020, uh, it has been turned into the National Carers Survey. Um, it is a survey where, through which we aim to better understand what carers want and need. Um, and that very strongly informs, like I said, our organization's direction, uh, what kinds of support we develop and try to provide uh, our, and our systemic advocacy for all carers, both on the state level where we are mainly active, but it also informs many uh, advocacy activities that we together with the other carer um, organizations from the other states and territories. Um, 
have on the federal level. It is designed with an academic, um, academic advisory panel, but very importantly, also under uh, the involvement of care representatives um, and the other state and territory care organizations and their um, feedback loops. Um, just quickly, um, that QR code will bring you to the full report of the last edition, which was launched on Monday. Uh, the URL is carelessnewsofwales.org.au slash research slash survey, where you can see um, the findings from this survey and uh, where we tr how we try to communicate um, carers' uh, needs and what carers need through our research uh, into the public. Um, on the next slide, I already have sort of the opportunity to um, participate in this survey when it comes around the next time. So this URL here on your screen um, and the uh, QR code, sorry, second QR code, I've got another one, um, uh, brings you to a form where you can register to receive updates about the progress of the 2024 survey. Uh, you can pre-order paper questionnaires if you prefer to uh, fill out surveys on paper rather than uh, on a computer screen, and where it can help us promote um, the care of service through um, ordering material that you can distribute uh, in uh, care groups that you're active. And we would very much appreciate your support. And um, generally, if you have any questions about the survey, please feel free to contact me. The survey is only one of our research projects. So um, there's a big number of carers researchers that have been um, participating in the care knowledge exchange as well. So on the next slide, um, I wanna talk briefly about our research community newsletter. Uh, the research community is a network of carers usually living in New South Wales, but we have members from all over the country. Um, and uh, this newsletter goes out once a month um, and it promotes um, research opportunities and consultation opportunities that are relevant for carers. So if you um, are a carer who wants to participate in research, who wants to share their experience, this is a good way to start, subscribe to our, our newsletter. Again, a QR code. We all know how that works now. Um, and um, Through that newsletter, you will be informed about ways you can participate in various research projects. These are not research projects run by, run by Carers New South Wales, but we select them, we vet them um, for their um, uh, ethical standards, uh, for, their, for their quality, and for their relevance to carers. Uh, if you're a researcher in the audience today um, and you want to promote your research, please contact us on the research at Carers New South Wales to talk to the U. Um, yeah, so this is one of the big um, ways how we try to um, get carers involved in research. And um, on the next page, another program that we use um, to um, encourage or to, to bring carers and researchers in contact with each other is the care, our care representative program. So in our care representative program, um, uh, we train our volunteer carers who volunteer to be part of this program. Uh, to uh, use their lived experience um, to speak for the needs of all carers. So um, you will receive some media training, training information about how committees work, how consultations work, uh, and a little bit of training in how you can use your own experience to advocate, not just for people in your situation, but more generally um, how to, um, yeah, represent um, the interests of all carers in forums such as, uh, like Giselle mentioned, co-design groups, um, project advisory groups, where it's very often important, like um, Giselle, and, uh, Giselle and Bruce said before, where carers often need to advo advocate for themselves as part of a group, but where it's very important that carers are um, present in order to steer a project in a way that it benefits carers. Um, and if you're interested in joining that, we always take on new volunteers. Um, the email address is care representatives at carersunitsofspells.org.au. Um, feel free to contact us on an inquiry and our lovely colleagues will um, get back to you um, as soon as possible. Um, that's it from me. So a few practical um, steps you can take right away um, to um, help uh, make research more inclusive of carers and help represent carers, um, yeah, for benefit uh, of uh, for the benefit of of, of carers um, in the research world. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Lucas, and thanks, Tian, for putting those links in the chat. Um, and so we've heard from um, a few different angles, I guess, about what kinds of opportunities exist in research, some of the considerations, um, some of the challenges. Um, you've got some concrete steps that you can take to get involved in research. I can see some familiar names in our list um, that are from our Care Rep program that Lucas mentioned. Um, we've also got some of our um, Care Advisory Group and Research Advisory Group members here today. Um, our next uh, part of this um, uh, webinar is going to be discussion and Q&A. Um, and so we've had some Q&A come through already. Um, and so we will move into that, uh, that part of the, um, the session. Um, we did just have a question come up around um, remuneration. It's always hard to get my mouth around that word um, from Linda. Um, and uh, that's a good question, Linda, um, and certainly um, does come up as part of um, what Giselle talked about earlier and what Lucas uh, spoke about just now as well, is that many research opportunities, not all, but uh, many, and in, in many cases, most, if they're through universities, will have some kind of remuneration. So it's something that's usually promoted. Um, and certainly um, you can ask about when you're ha having opportunities arise. Um, so we're now going to uh, have all of our speakers um, join in a bit of a panel discussion. Um, and uh, looking at our questions today, um, so we uh, did get a question um, or a comment um, about uh, just exhaustion with the repetition of research without improvements. Um, and I know that our, our speakers did touch on that um, a little bit. And look, as, as someone that's worked um, in carer research for a number of years now, um, we are very conscious of that. Um, so I wondered whether any of our panelists wanted to comment on um, just this, this comment around um, uh, how to manage um, exhaustion and and looking at how to, how the research is going to impact or improve um, services. Did anyone want to comment on that? I'm happy to speak to that from a carer's perspective. <laughs> That's true. Because um, I can really empathise with that. Um, it is really challenging when you kind of give your time, your attention to something and then you walk away and you, you don't really get any um, information as to how it translated or whether it did translate at all or don't see anything perhaps happening quite quickly. I think one thing I have learned, especially from being a part of this role in um, the Care Knowledge Exchange, is that things do happen slowly. Um, so the research begins and the participation that you um, are involved in, whether it be one survey or a week's work or, you know, meeting up once a month for however long, that is the initial stages. So that's when they are getting the information. That information then needs to be translated. And then once that information is translated, it needs to be placed in the right hands to become something actionable. And I think um, that's where as carers in um, conjunction with um, bodies such as Carers New South Wales um, and projects such as the Care Knowledge Exchange, we can then step into that kind of advocacy role beyond research where we're encouraging pushing that to the um, policymakers um, and the current governments um, to see those shifts happening. Um, but I think when it comes to kind of, I guess, guarding your own energy, um, and, you know, feeling that burnout from it, it's, it's, you don't always have to participate, you know, if you do see something coming up and it does interest you, but you're feeling those, you know, those burnout, um, feelings, take a step back, participate in stuff that you see that really inspires you, um, and be mindful of how much it is that you can sustainably commit to. That's great. Thank you, Prue. Um, Giselle, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I think one of the, and this is not a paid advertiser, I think the knowledge exchange is part of that, that so many things were happening and we didn't know, like, like you know, it could be in WA and New South Wales doing exactly the same research. And I think part of that knowledge exchange is getting that community and practice and for us to talk more um, amongst ourselves and say, okay, this already been done to death. It's time to move forward and scaffold and kind of do change the conversation because I, I agree I think it's exhausting and filling out the same information and asking the same questions even from a researcher point of view it's like that's not interesting either it's not changing anyone's life and and as and as Bruce mentioned there is a life span from when you start your research to when it actually changes 
But I think we do need to change the way in we translate the knowledge. And, you know, we tend to be academics. Oh, we pre-review. Nobody reads a pre-review. Nobody reads. But I'm more than willing to listen to a podcast, right? So we need to change the way that we convey information and to make things happen. And I, I kind of write to our process in terms of how much energy are you willing to give? It's, it's very important that you protect yourself and you care about yourself and kind of find that right balance where you want to have a say, but also make sure that you have time for yourself and 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 your well-being so it's it's important to be engaged at the level that you're able to provide input but also care for yourself so i think that's my viewpoint thanks giselle um so really important perspectives there and thanks for answering that question and also to add around the care and knowledge exchange and also carers in south wales's research work um we're really committed to, through this project, um, upskilling researchers to work with carers more effectively. And um, we will have some opportunities concretely and have already to kind of um, help communicate with, with researchers some of the frustrations that carers experience, which is, um, I think, a really important opportunity. Um, but similarly, by connecting research that is about carers and giving it a platform through this project, um, that really helps us to sort of, um, I guess, just uh, make everybody do it better. Make sure that the, the people that need to hear the evidence are hearing it. That's that's really at the core of this project um, so that we can have a best opportunity for change, but also to make sure that um, we, we're ironing out some of these issues around, you know, repeated questions and things like that. So it's definitely something that the project is committed to. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later how you can get involved in that ongoing. Um, in terms of other questions that have come up, so... Um, we had uh, a question specifically uh, for you, Lucas, around the research community, um, uh, noting that it's only open to New South Wales. Um, and did you want to speak to that? Well, um, yes, I presented it like this because it's an old <laughs> um, description because we are the state uh, peak uh, organisation for New South Wales. So, yes, it is a bit focused on New South Wales, but you can subscribe regardless of where you are. And um, many... Um, Many projects that are advertised might have a nationwide um, recruitment. So um, a lot of it is, um, especially now through Zoom, even qualitative projects, it, it always depends how, how locally uh, confined the, the, the actual research project is. So I would encourage you to just, just subscribe. I'm sure that there will be some opportunities for you to participate regardless where you live. Um, yes, it is just that... Um, I don't know whether other states have a similar a similar platform. And the other platform is, of course, like mentioned, the Care and Logs Exchange, which is um, sort of aims explicitly for, for the whole country and not just New South Wales. And I can add to that as well. So um, Carers New South Wales is part of the national network, National Care Network, and there are other carers organisations that sometimes do recruit for research. Um, so... Uh, I would encourage you as well to um, join the research community, but also to connect in with the Care Knowledge Exchange, which will bring those and other opportunities around um, at a more national level um, around participation. And we're working on some new um, ways of broadening that participation as well. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, Lucas. Thanks, Sorry, oh, yes. thank you, Jonas, for your comment. I will revisit that form then. I did not, I wasn't that we had that was. Thanks. We have made some changes recently to that, so we'll make sure that that's updated. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, we had another question come through around um, uh, people that are um, uh, maybe needing individual advocacy and um, that there's uh, not a recognition of carers' experiences. Um, and so um, I'm not quite sure um, what the question is there, but I suppose... Um, uh, something that definitely um, is a, a focus of this uh, project is to raise awareness of carers' experiences. Um, did you want to uh, clarify that question, Leslie, or ask a supplementary question um, of our panel? Um, if you'd like to, please feel free to, to add that there. Um, we did get a, another question as well around respite. So um, someone has asked, is there any work coming up concerning respite? If so, I'd be very interested. Um, so we've had um, uh, some links shared there. Um, uh, did anyone want to comment on that, Lucas? Um, do you want to mention anything about respite? Um, on the one hand, respite is always a focus in the um, care serve. We're going to look at it a bit more in 2024. We've got a project coming up together with a collaborator around replacement care 
um, in the next year, where um, together with Mara Hamilton on an ARC grant. Uh, it is an, I'm not quite sure how it will exactly look, but uh, yes, uh, respite is, is one of the most significant service types for carers. And we see from our results in the carer survey that um, the access to respite is decisive for, for good, good outcomes for carers. So um, yes, we are, are um, a few projects and a few ways to research are in the works. And um, I would say, stay tuned. We will um, communicate over the Care Knowledge Exchange and um, our other means um, once we go live with them. Thanks, Lucas. Um, and uh, we're nearly out of time for questions, but we have one question left, which I might um, just put to our panelists as well. And that is, how do we engage with young carers in research and what special considerations are required to include young carers? Um, Prue, did you want to comment on that or Giselle? I can speak briefly to it. Um, I think it's, you know, the young carer age bracket is quite a large age bracket. It um, begins before someone is considered an adult um, and then carries on until about 25. Uh, so it really depends on, you know, what um, age group you're looking at. That 18 to 25 um, age group, you know, carers are then, um, young carers are then independent to choose what they participate in. Um, and then before that 18 um, age bracket, then it obviously does include parental consent. Um, I do think it's really important to hear from young carers. Um, I was a young carer until I aged out. Um, and I think it is a unique experience when you are younger and still kind of figuring out who you are um, yourself. Um, and then you have this immense responsibility and it can, you know, completely change your perspective on life and the choices that you make long term. Um and I think what is really important from a carer's perspective, especially when dealing with young carers, is to make sure that there is that back end support. Um, so a lot of times um, things can really um, arise within research because you are encouraged to reflect on your experience. And when you encourage to reflect on your experience, sometimes you acknowledge things that are easy to kind of push aside when you're in the moment. Um, so I think it is super important, especially when dealing with younger minds, um, to make sure that there is aftercare, be it in mental health um, and wellbeing check-ins, opportunities to um, maybe contact or reflect with someone else in a similar experience, um, to make sure that, you know, they aren't being kind of left with this um, whiplash after they're caring, um, after sharing, sorry, their experience, especially when they may not already have those kinds of tools or understanding of the emotions that are arising due to their age. Yeah, I think I can just echo that good research also has a duty of care. And when things like that, they, there needs to be those safeguards to protect, especially young carers. It's important to hear the voice because there's transitions as you transition through life, things change. And in terms of ethics, as Prue mentioned, is we also, we obviously, depending on which age bracket we're talking to, we have different ethics requirements. And at some points it means parental consent, but also the child, if it's a child, needs to assent. So sometimes it's not a matter of whether my parent wants me to participate, but I, as a child, I also need to want to participate. Or sometimes it's the other way around, where the child wants to participate, but the parent may not be. So there are lots of considerations until they get an age where they can consent and it's appropriate for them to join as a decision maker for themselves. But throughout, it's important to really always have that duty of care, whether it's a child, a young adult or an older care, wherever you are, this always has to be a duty of care. So that's what good research looks like. And always look look for those red flags when you participate in research, when you feel cared for and you feel that things are done in a proper way. So that's also something important to keep in mind. Thanks very much. And um, uh, I think, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time for our Q&A, but um, for those that um, may still have some unanswered questions, um, please do contact um, the research email address, which was included in the chat, um, and we can follow up with you after the webinar. Um, we have had a very uh, you know, high level introduction or taster in today's webinar for participating in research. And really our passion and our aim in today's webinar was to just give you some different perspectives on how and why you might participate in research, because um, we all believe that um, it's really important to capture carers' voices and a range of carers' voices in research to ensure that um, that evidence base can be used to improve things for carers. 
So hopefully that's given you a taste. Um, please do feel free to follow up with us. Um, and the main way to, uh, I guess, connect with those opportunities and to also continue to be part of a conversation around capturing carers' views and research is to uh, connect with the Care Knowledge Exchange. There's a few different ways that you can do that. Um, but uh, what we, um, I guess, would want to point you to, um, and uh, our original chair um, for today's session, who sends his apologies, um, really wanted to point out that um, one of the activities of the Care Knowledge Exchange is um, a communities of practice component. And one of our communities of practice is focused on capturing lived experience in uh, research. And so um, this webinar is part of that, um, looking at the carer side. We also have some um, resources that are going to be developed and some other events with a focus on researchers around building that um, that experience and skill set, like I mentioned before. And so if um, this concept interests you and you'd like to be part of further discussions about how to improve engagement of carers in research, um, not just participate in research itself, um, please do connect with the Care Knowledge Exchange. And there's actually, um, we have a communities of practice sign up form um, as well, which um, uh, I think we should be able to, to share here as well. But if not, um, please do just uh, uh, connect on um, the links that are provided in the chat. Um, and uh, we will be able to keep you updated about um, uh, what is coming out in this area. And so I think we want to bring up the slides again, um, just with some uh, little high level uh, kind of pointers about what is uh, going on in the Care Knowledge Exchange. Um, and while that happens, um, uh, we are going to wrap up today's session. So there we go, call to action. So um, just listed on there are some of the ways that you might be able to get involved with um, the Care Knowledge Exchange. Um, visit the link in the chat. Um, there's Spotlight series, which feature um, different emerging research findings. There's our research incubator events. There's our communities of practice. There's a new discussion forum on the website. Um, there's Peru's contributions, a blog and a podcast. Um, so please do check that out and um, importantly subscribe for updates. You can also follow the Care Knowledge Exchange on social media. Um, and uh, we, uh, in wrapping up today's session, um, we're pleased to include something that is uh, a regular part of our Care Knowledge Exchange events, which is um, that Peru, who you met earlier, um, is going to, uh, in her wearing her other hat, um, her sort of um, uh, yoga teacher hat, is going to do um, a closing guided meditation just in recognition of um, the importance that we all spoke to of looking after our well-being as carers. Um, and so just before I hand over to Prue, um, uh, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today um, for the official part of our session, um, for the information. Um, we will send around further information after the session and there will be a feedback survey that pops up. Um, but please do consider getting involved in research. If you um, have suggestions for how um, care engagement and research can be improved, please let us know. Um, and um, on that note, uh, happy National Carers Week, and um, I will close and hand over to Prue. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. So as I said earlier, that wellbeing point, um, meditation or an opportunity to pause and process uh, what you've just absorbed is a wonderful way um, to make sure that you kind of feel at ease or grounded with whatever's come up. Um, so I feel like it is a real privilege to seal these sessions with meditation as sometimes some tricky things do come up um, as we reflect on certain caring experiences. So wherever you are currently, um, finding a seat that is comfortable for you. If you are seated on a chair, can you please make sure that both of your feet are on the ground? And that's gonna give you a little bit of stability. And then start by plugging your heels into the earth and to feel that stability, the base of your feet. You might notice as you plug your heels down, you feel your buttocks engaging ever so slightly. So shift your attention now to that area of your body and noticing the sit bones. And they are the two pointy parts of your anatomy that press, press through the fleshiness of your buttocks. Allow them to ground down and that will then transfer your attention to the lower back space and start to find a little bit of lightness through the spine by reaching the crown of your head to the ceiling. And if you haven't already, it might feel nice to gently close down your eyes. You're always welcome to keep them open if that is more comfortable for you. And allow your front body to settle into the back, the back body to sink into the space or whatever it is behind you. Relieving you of the need to interact 
in this moment, but instead tune in. And perhaps come to notice that with this shift in posture, has there come a shift in your alertness, your attention? And start to walk your mind through your body now from crown of the head to tips of the toes. This time as you do so, noticing if there is anywhere that is feeling tense, tight, resistant. So for me personally right now, I'm feeling a lot of tension in my shoulders. You could feel the same or maybe that's translating somewhere else, such as the fingers or the toes. Wherever you feel that tension, can you direct an exhalation to that space to encourage some ease and you don't have to completely free yourself of that tension but if you find five percent more ease five percent more relaxation then you have achieved so much and then start to witness the naturally occurring breath your inhale and your exhale. And getting curious about its nature. What is the pace, the depth, the texture of your breath? This is an exercise of curiosity. No need to shift, change, or judge the breath. Merely acknowledge the breath. And sometimes through the process of acknowledging the breath, it naturally becomes more steady more expansive. And if you'd like to feel more fullness in your breath as you inhale, concentrate on first expanding the belly, then the waist, then the chest space. As you exhale, release the breath and feel an ease from the chest to the waist, to the belly. Ian, how feeling all pockets of space available were there. Exhale, letting go, finding a little bit of ease. If you're starting to notice the mind wander again, no worries, anchor it back into the moment. And for you, it might feel more supportive to acknowledge the physical body, to feel your feet on the earth, your sit bones pressing into the seat, your spine growing tall. Or maybe for you, the pathway is being curious about the breath. What does this breath feel like? Where does this breath expand into? What is the depth of this breath? And the point of meditation is to not completely clear the mind. The mind's job is to think, but it's to encourage you to return to presence and to let go of thoughts that arise that aren't necessary or that aren't serving you in that moment so that you can focus on what is right here, right now. And just a few more conscious breaths. And then bring your hands to me. As your hands meet, keeping your eyes closed down, if they are closed, start to rub your hands together. As you rub your hands together, you might notice the uh, friction, the heat and energy arising beneath your palms. And then find stillness with your hands again and cup your hands in front of your eyes. That heat will start to transfer towards your face. Once you feel that heat arriving on your skin, gently blink the eyes open. 
absorb the texture of your hands, maybe acknowledging the unique patterns that are there. And then when it feels good for you, you can slowly move your hands away from your face to absorb once again what surrounds you. What you might notice prominently is the screen in front of you. And take a few moments to let the eyes adjust. Thank you. Thanks, Hugh, and thanks, everyone. Uh, Prue, not Hugh, and thanks, everyone. <laughs> Goodness. Um, and uh, we will see you next time.